God can do a lot with a little bit of vision. God can do immense things with a little bit of vision. And today, God's got a message for someone because what we're going to do today is talk about the most significant vision, the biggest vision you can ever have for your life ever. But before we do that, I want to go back to like the, the key theme we started with from the first Sunday of this year. You know, it was kind of something that bled over from, from the New Year's Eve into this year, and we've been talking about it throughout the year. And it's this idea, it's this idea that we live in such a noisy time and season and place in world history with all our technology and all our media and all our influences, all the marketing campaigns, billions being pumped into marketing to try to, you know, get us to fix our minds on things that might be contrary to the word of God, that there's nothing greater and grander that we can do with our lives than to focus on this one thing, what God is saying, the word of God. The enemy is exhibiting all of his resources, expending, I should say, all of his resources to get us to stop thinking about the word of God. And sometimes on the prayer line, I say to people, I'll say, I know I sound like, you know, a broken record. I keep saying the same thing over and over. But I'm saying the same thing over and over because I don't want this to just be one of those messages that we talk about, you know, on a Sunday at the beginning of the year. And then everyone says, oh, my God, I love that word. That was so powerful. And then we forget about it by the next month. That happens so many times. That happens to me. I'll listen to an amazing sermon. I'll be like, oh, my God, this sermon is about to change my life. And like two days later, I've already forgotten what we talked about. I liked the message. I thought the message was powerful. It was powerful. It may have even marginally changed my life, but because I didn't keep coming back to that word, it wasn't able to take deep roots. And what we see with God is he, he makes it very clear to us. He says something to this effect. He says, you need more than bread for life. You need to feed on every single word that protrudeth from the mouth of God. What is he saying? He says, you know how you eat every day? You know how you eat most of you multiple times a day? You know how you eat some of us maybe like more than we should every day and multiple times? He says, do that. Devour the word of God. Like constantly be thinking about it. You need it more than you actually need the food you're eating. You need it because there's this constant inflow of lies and, and half-truths. And things that are designed to get you off your game and get your mind thinking negatively. And God knows that he says, it's coming so consistently in so many waves that you need to eat and devour this word every single day. As often as you can to the point, in fact, that you feel like you're kind of even overdoing it. You cannot, you know, and they put it like this. What's the difference between, you know the word of the Lord in a piece of cheesecake is you cannot overeat the word of the Lord. You can overeat. Like if I, I, I just put up, line up 20 pizzas, pepperoni, of course, because who does just cheese these days? But if I were to do that, like you can overeat that. But if you were just to spend all day just, just eating and eating and eating and feeding on the word of God, all you're going to do is get set free. That's the only outcome. We need to be word of God gluttons, you know? Just, just taking it in all the time, letting it just be all that we are doing, like just be obsessed with this word. That's the great thing that I, I, I'm, I'm praying for you because I know there are things trying to get into your mind today. Maybe right now as we speak, there could be lies trying to flood your mind right now as we speak. Maybe it was before church. Maybe it's during church. Maybe it's after church. Maybe it's when you're praying, your private time, something trying to distract your mind and fight and wage war against your mind and make you believe that you're not good enough and that you can't do it and that people are saying negative things about you and that your future that God has promised you is not going to come to pass. And the Lord's saying, no, I need you to feed only on this word, and that is it. 
the vision for this year, that we would feed only and exclusively on the word of God. The word of God is not one of many sources of information we take in, but it's the only source of information we use. And the way it looks practically is that when we hear some piece of information that might come from the news or, or, or the radio or, or a friend or family member, or even our own mind, we always go back and think of the word of God. Would Jesus agree with this? Does Jesus agree that I'm going to be a failure? Does he agree that I'm going to be alone forever, that I'm never going to find the right person? Is that how Jesus talks? That's how Satan talks, but is that how Jesus talks? This inflation is going to you know, have an awful impact on the economy, and it's going to be game over for everybody, and you're going to lose your job. And that might be how people talk, but is that what God's saying? Didn't he promise that in Malachi 3 that if you'll, if, if you'll be willing to, to give and, and, and bring your tithes to the storehouse, he'll cause you to overflow with blessing. So is that really what Jesus is saying? Would God align with what's being said? That's how we only consider his word. And um, I just think it's powerful that we do that. The vision I want us to have is that we are only talking about God's word forever and ever. And, you know, it's interesting. When I was praying before I came up, I said to the Lord something to the effect of this, that I'm hoping that what he can do is just come into me and us in such a way that literally every single component of what we do and say and think is influenced by him. Like, I don't I don't really fully understand how to explain to you how he does this. I just know he can do that. Not just because he can do anything, but because there are many mysteries as articulated in scripture. You know, like it, it says in the word, there's a mystery how, you know, a man and woman can get married and they become one flesh. No one can really explain it, Paul says, but it like happens somehow in the spirit realm. No one can really fully explain how the Holy Spirit lives within us, but somehow, some way, it comes and dwells within us, and now we become like Jesus. And not only that, we can do the things Jesus did, and greater things, according to Jesus himself, will we do. I don't know how to explain that. I just know that God said that that is true. So we can do that. So in our minds, like there's this, there's this idea that's articulated in the, in the word of God. It's something like this. It says, we take captive every thought and bring it into obedience of Jesus Christ. We take it captive. We see a thought and we grab that thought. And we rip that thought down if it doesn't agree with the, with the word of the Lord. And we say, I command this thought to come into agreement with God. So the way it looks tangibly is the thought comes and it tells us that we should be afraid. And we grab hold of that thought of fear and we say, but the word of God says. The word of God says, I've not been given a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind or self-control, one translation says. So I, I want to just lay some of that out for you today before we kind of get into the crux of, of, of this particular teaching on vision. There's a vision that I want you all to get, but I want us to start with just giving you this understanding that like, there's nothing I want more for us, saints, than to fully be fixated on the word of God, obsessed with the word of God, always taking it in. <clears throat> now, I was listening to a man of God earlier in the, in the week. I listened to a lot of, you know, godly content. I'm always trying to, you know, hear different perspectives on the word and learn more from other, you know, very seasoned leaders in Christ. And this man of God was saying, <clears throat> he was very funny in the way he was describing it. He was saying, I used to not want to do what God said and follow his laws. I used to not want to follow God's laws. You know why? Because I didn't understand that his laws are for my good. 
He says, when I was in high school and someone tells you, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, drink anymore and, and get drunk. You, you can't curse anymore and all these other kind of things. That I used to love cussing. I used to love, you know, drinking. I used to love watching inappropriate content online. I used to love all those things, and now I can't do it, and I was mad and kind of sad about it. But then as you grow older, you come to understand it's for your own good. Because he was saying, and this is so true, and many of you, this will resonate with you. Have any of us ever heard somebody who's an alcoholic just say, oh my God, I'm so, so glad I got into my, I had my first drink. Oh my God. I'm so glad that this, my alcohol problem, that it, that it caused me to, to lose my job. Like, I just, man, am I glad about that. I'm so glad, like, I got into drugs. I'm so glad that I had that affair and then, all, you know, after that, that it ruined my marriage and I broke my family apart. I'm so glad that that happened. Man, that was a good choice by me. I'm getting nothing but wins all over the place. Nobody talks like that. Even in, like the, even in the secular world, people don't talk that way. But that's where you have that understanding. Like, God gives us these rules and regulations and standards in order to help us not to hurt us. It's out of love that he gives these boundaries. In a similar way, it's out of love that he gives us his word and he wants us to be fixated on it. Let me be very clear on what I'm saying. A lot of us don't want to spend as much time with God because we don't really understand how it's benefiting us. We don't understand fully how focusing exclusively on the word of God will benefit us. We think to spend hours and hours with God, say, on a Saturday or a Sunday or during the week before work or, or, or later at night after work or on the prayer line, we don't get how that's going to benefit us somehow. We're blind to the reality that we need that. Because when we do that, what does God say? He says where the Spirit is, and when we spend time with God, we're spending time with His Holy Spirit, there is freedom. As we spend time with him, we are receiving freedom. Whether we like the freedom, whether you asked for it or not, in fact. God is giving you freedom. Freedom is finding you. And so we have to spend this time with him. Focusing only on his word. But now finally I want to get to uh, Ephesians in the third chapter. <clears throat> Ephesians 3. I'll give you a moment. As we get there, wow, um, I want to go to Ephesians 3, and we'll go to verse 18. But before we, we get there, I'll just give you a little bit of context before we take a look at that particular passage of Scripture there. You know, one of the hard things in life sometimes to understand for some people is, and this is, this is related to this idea of having a big vision, I want you all to have this massive vision. I'll explain this to you, to you, why we all need this vision. This is a vision that everyone should share. <clears throat> and it's that God loves you beyond what you can ever be capable of understanding. That God loves you so much, he will not allow you to be defeated. This vision is something that, quite honestly, very few people in the church actually have. And we know that few people have it because whenever a trial comes to people who don't have it, they stress out about it. But whenever somebody does have this full understanding and has this vision and this, this, this deeper level of understanding of God's love, at that moment of trial or tribulation, the person who has that vision fully is not shaken. They're unflappable, even in the midst of that. <clears throat> and my goal for you is that you would all be able, and that I would be able, and all of us everywhere would be able to just enjoy the life that God's given us because we only have it for a short time. We don't have forever here. And forget about the past. Our future can be full of joy. Our future can be full of life. Our future can be full of understanding. Our future can be full of laughs. That's what the Lord wants, but it only comes when we understand the extent of his love. Without understanding that, then all the circumstances of life that come against us are going to make us feel down. But when we understand how much our love, how loved we are, I should say, by God, then we're all right. It says this. 
And I just want to preface my, this reading with just this final thought, which is that I also want you to understand that I know you don't understand that God loves you. I, I know you don't really fully understand that, by the way. In fact, there's none of you out there anywhere who's listening and anywhere in all of the earth who has ever lived that understands how much God loves you. None of you understand it. If you were able to understand it, you would never have a fear again in your life. I promise you. But you can't understand it. And you, some of you may think, well, it, what do you mean I can't understand it? Like, how are, how, how are you saying that? Like, I know in, in some way I've been taught at Sunday school, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. But no, you don't understand how much he loves you, though. Jesus himself says this. He says in Ephesians chapter 318, Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love really is. That's verse 18. And may you experience the love of Christ, though it is so great that you will never fully understand it. I'm going to stop right there. And may you experience the love of Christ, though it is so great that you cannot possibly understand it. It is humanly not possible for you to understand how much he loves you. It is only by his grace that we can amass the power to understand just how much you are loved and cherished by God and how he would do anything to have you. And if you think he's going to let that adversity in your way stop him from blessing you, you've got another thing coming because you don't understand the extent of the love. We can't understand it. That is the reason why when trouble comes against us, we get down. When someone says something negative, we get down. When Satan comes with his idiotic lies because he's a loser, we get down. That's the reason why. Because we are just struggling to understand, can he possibly love me enough? Why am I going through this if he loves me? He loves you more than you can understand. I cannot explain it to you. It's not possible for me. And we can go home. If, we're, if, if the task is going to be, Tim, explain to everybody how much God loves them, we should all just leave. Because according to the word of God, it is so immense. You will never fully understand it. But, you know, I'm reminded of this word that, that Jesus, that the, 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 the power of God gave to Jesus. And the, and the disciples asked him, who can enter into the kingdom of heaven? And he stopped and he thought about it and he said, humanly speaking, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And so, that which is not possible for us can become possible with God. And I, I know you don't understand how much he loves you. I know you don't, you don't understand that, that he's not going to, that that sickness can't stop him from loving you. And that what they said about you can't stop him from loving you. I know you don't understand, uh, otherwise you'd have more peace. But, but with his power, with the power of God, like the power that he was speaking about when he was speaking of how God can give people entry into the kingdom of heaven, it is possible. So we, we just pray right now, the Holy Spirit, just a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, just give us the ability to somehow understand how deeply you love us. It's not possible for our human minds, but if we have the mind of Christ, though, which the Word of God says we have access to, then, Lord Jesus, we can know how deeply you love us, and then that can give us the peace that we need. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, amen. We receive that. Now, saints, um, one other thing. You know, we've been talking about vision. Pastor Avenel teaching on vision this year. We've been talking about vision. <clears throat> and, you know, I'm still looking at Ephesians. And uh, huh. what a lot of us want when we think about our vision for our lives is, 
It, 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 we want the power to accomplish. We want the power to achieve. We want the power to do what God's called us to do. We want to <clears throat> be able to sort of move forward in Christ. We want his power. You know, that's what a lot of us have a vision for. The, we want the power of God to, to be able to, you know, to achieve our goals. We want the power of God to be able to, you know, forgive and love our enemies. We want the power of God to, you know, give us the strength and the courage we need. We want his power, yeah? But the word of God says something in the second half of Ephesians 3 and verse 19. It says, may you experience the love of Christ. <clears throat> Though it is so great, you will never fully understand it. Then, turn to somebody and say, then. Then you will be filled with the fullness of life and power <clears throat> that comes from God. The word of God says, there are some of you out there, and what you want is the fullness of life. The fullness of life is just this, this vibrance for life, this excitement about life. This, you're, you're taking it all in, like in Ecclesiastes where it says, eat, drink, and be merry, and enjoy your work, whatever you're doing under the sun, and just have a good time and laugh with your friends and love your family and love your wife and your husband and enjoy time with your kids. That's the fullness of life. All right, so that's what we're talking about. A lot of us want the power that comes from God so we can accomplish our goals, we can do great works, we can lay hands on the sick and they can be healed, and we can do all these amazing things. You want the fullness of life. You want the power of God to overcome any obstacle. But the Word of God says, if you want that first, you must experience the love of Christ. When we experience the love of Christ, then we have the fullness of life. When we realize and when we think all day about how much he loves us, then we have the power that comes from God. It is with the meditation about how much he loves you. The, the constant thinking and reminding yourself that I'm valuable. My life has meaning. I'm not alone. He promised to never leave me or forsake me. That is what brings the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. So I don't know about you, but I want the fullness of life. I want his power. And the word of God says that when I experience his love, when I, in other words, think of his love, remind myself of his love, then I get that. Then I get the thing I'm looking for. So I'm hoping that somebody out there is getting something out of this so far. Um, I hope that someone's getting something out of this. There's, there's maybe one other verse I want to share with you before we, we spend time praying, <clears throat> before we hear from Pastor Avenel and what have you. And there's two verses in my Bible that I'd flagged. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of which one I want to read for you all first. I think I'm going to go to, yeah, I think I'm going to go to a 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4 first, and, and bear with me. Sorry about my cough. I don't have coronavirus. I probably just need a water. Um, but anyway, let's go to 2 Corinthians 4, and then we can go also into, into Romans, the 8th chapter. So we're going to be 2 Corinthians 4, then Romans 8. I'm just giving you the, the preview so you can be ready to turn there in your scriptures um, when, if, if you want to follow along in that dimension. <clears throat> but, um, you know, what I wanted to just to say to folks is that... Um, Thank you very much. What I wanted to say to folks is that a lot of us, <clears throat> our struggles basically derive from experiencing all the troubles of life, yeah? That's where really our worry comes from, and that's where the stress comes from. It all sort of stems from this fact that, and that there are these issues that come up against us, and we're, we're concerned about the issues, and it causes us to lose faith, and the enemy used that, and he says, look at this issue going on in your life. Like, God can't love you. You're not going to accomplish your dreams because this thing wouldn't be happening to you. You, know, you think you're going to accomplish your dreams? Well, I'm attacking your mind right now. You think you're going to accomplish your dreams? Well, I sent a spirit of infirmity to come against you. But at the end of the day, we have to believe the word of God. <clears throat> and what does it say in 2 Corinthians 4, 17? 
2 Corinthians 4, 17. I'm going to read for you from the um, New Living Translation, 4, 17. <clears throat> it says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is seen, not what, on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I'm going to read it for you again in a different translation. It says, for our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see right now. Rather, we look forward to what we have not yet seen. For the troubles we see will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. God says the troubles you're facing, relatively speaking, are quite small. The troubles you face are quite small. They're really not so big of a deal if you think about it. They're not so difficult to deal with if you really think about it. They're quite small. <clears throat> but you know what it also says? And this is interesting, things. It says it produces for us an, immeasur an immeasurably great glory that lasts forever. It says, in other words, your troubles are productive. Turn to somebody and say produce. It says in the word of God, <clears throat> those troubles are not random. It says, in fact, that they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. This is an interesting thought. You know, in James chapter 1, you don't have to turn there, I'll just give it to you. It talks about how when we face troubles... It is a reason and a cause for us to celebrate. Because it says the only way you build real endurance is if you're tested through your troubles. And it says that when you're tested like that, that will make you a perfect and complete person who doesn't need anything. You won't be asking people to help you anymore because you just can deal with whatever. Because God will have shown you that you're the real deal. God will have shown you that you're too strong. God will have shown you the enemy can't hold you down. God will show you that actually you're kind of kicking the enemy's butt. He wants to like flee whenever he sees you. God will show you all of these things as troubles come. They're producing for you a glory. They're productive. And that glory of being perfected, that glory of being able to endure will last forever. It will last forever. So that's what we see in the word of God. It will not last forever. <clears throat> but now, you know, I want to end on this note. I want to end on this last note for people here, Romans chapter 8. eight go to 838. Romans 838 of the scripture. And I'm going to read it for you because I want to close on this thought as just a reminder. You know, the Lord spoke to me about being fully convinced earlier today. Even as we were praying, you know, we, we all, for the most part, those of you who are watching this video or who are here in the room hearing this message, you've heard the word of God before. But it's not about the word you hear, it's the word you believe. It's about being fully convinced about what God says. And I want to read this verse for you, this collection of verses. Then, then what I'm going to do before we close is I'm going to pray <clears throat> that God will help us to be fully convinced. 838, that's where we're going to be. <clears throat> it says something in verse 38. It says, And I am convinced... That nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't and life can't. The angels can't. The demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, and even the power of hell can't keep God's love away. Whether we are high above the sky or the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, who is our Lord. <clears throat> Today, saints of God, I want you to be fully convinced that there's nothing that can separate you from his love. I want you to be fully convinced that 
every single word in this book is true. I want you to be fully convinced, fully and totally convinced that if God's for you, no one can ever be against you and fully convinced that you don't even understand how much he loves you and that it must be so much greater than you understand. And to let that thought that God loves me, in fact, he loved me more than I could ever understand. In fact, he loved me more than my parents or my spouse or my loved ones or anybody who's ever loved anybody in the history of the world. I want you to be so convinced of that that it brings you peace. That it brings you peace. That when you're going through the trials you'll remember that that the being who's in control of everything loves me more than my human mind will even allow me to understand. And may that thought bring you peace. And so I'm going to wrap us up in prayer here and then invite up Pastor Avenel. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you today for, for everything, Lord. You know, we... We all go through our challenges in different ways, everybody. Whether you're Jesus Christ or whether you're, you know, just a person living in this contemporary time, whether you're a, a pastor, whether you uh, are a churchgoer, whether you, are, you know, are somebody who's, who's not even a believer yet. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. You all go through challenges, every person on earth. But you know, Heavenly Father, we want to be convinced, Lord, just... I pray you just give us a new spirit. Renew our minds with this spirit that we only, we're just so convinced of your word. We're so trusting in you that we would actually believe the word of God. That we would believe that if you're for us, no one can ever at any point in time be against us. That we'd believe that you that you love us so dearly, Heavenly Father, we can't understand it, that we would believe that you sent your only son to die on a cross, and since you were willing to send even your only begotten son, of course you'll be willing to send anything else we need. That we believe that we'll do greater works in our life than you were were even doing while you were here, Jesus. That's what you say. That we'll be fully convinced, because then we'll know. Then we'll know if the word says we'll do greater works than even Christ. And Christ came to destroy the works of the enemy. Then we don't have to be afraid of the enemy's works either. Because Christ came to destroy those. And he said, you do greater works even than that. Lord God, I pray that we would believe the word of God when it tells us that we are to rejoice in the Lord always. That you want us to have joy. I I, I pray that we'll believe that word that you want us to have joy and so we'll take it seriously and start just rejoicing so we can be joyful not letting the weight of the world and the weight of demonic attacks and the weight of whatever it is get in the way of our joy you can't steal my peace devil you can't steal our peace not in this church in the name of Jesus not in this church you're not going to steal anyone's peace no one's peace of mind shall be encumbered by the lies of Satan not here In the name of Jesus, we bind every lie. In the name of Jesus, we loose your mind. In the name of Jesus, you will have peace. In the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray, Father, we believe this word that says that where your spirit is, there's freedom. So that when we feel, when we feel like we're struggling, when we feel like, Lord God, that that life's not working, we feel depressed, we feel alone, we feel whatever we're feeling that's negative, that we wouldn't feel like we need to run to entertainment, run to, to, to a substance, run to anything else, that we would just run to you because we know we, that freedom will be there. Pray that we'll believe that you give us the power, as it says in Deuteronomy, to even make wealth, that you'll, you'll bless us, increase our territory. Yes, Lord, may we believe only in your word and not give any consideration to anything that does not derive from the mouth of God. In Jesus' mighty name, and amen.